This program contains graphic images and discussion of medical procedures. Viewer discretion is advised. We are so excited to be here with you tonight, and we want to thank you for your time, for taking the time out of your busy days to um, come and spend time with us and learn a little bit about what we're doing for our breast cancer patients at UCSF. Um, I am really lucky to have such a wonderful team. Um, I work with Dr. Catherine Park, who um, also treats breast cancer as our, our chair, uh, Nicholas Prionas, who um, just joined our faculty last year and who's a wonderful addition, who will also be speaking um, a little bit later in the lecture series, and Florence Yuan, who's our nurse practitioner and a critical part um, of our team as well, and she'll be speaking um, at the end of the lecture. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started. I'm gonna go ahead and share my slides. All right, so tonight our lecture series is entitled Close to the Heart Modern Radiation Therapy for Breast Cancer Treatment. We start off all of our lectures with learning objectives as if this were really medical school. And so tonight we will talk about the ways in which new technology can help us to better protect the heart during radiation therapy for breast cancer. We'll also talk about the stepwise progress towards shorter courses of treatment for breast cancer patients. And finally, we will tell you about UCSF's unique approach towards skin care in breast cancer patients. I'm gonna kick it off um, and talk about cardiac sparing techniques for our breast cancer patients. So again, the main learning objective of this section is to describe the ways in which new technology can help us to better protect the heart during radiation therapy for breast cancer. So I wanna start with some background. And the background is primarily this. Data from the 1980s suggests that adjuvant radiation therapy in breast cancer patients may have adverse effects in long-term survivors. Specifically, adjuvant radiation may increase the risk for cardiac death in these patients. Now, this is very concerning for us as breast cancer doctors because we know that breast um, radiation after breast conserving therapy, meaning a lumpectomy or partial mastectomy, is really important. And not only does it decrease the risk of local recurrence, it actually helps to decrease the risk that a woman will die from breast cancer. But we obviously don't want to give treatment that's going to have long-term adverse effects, especially in women with early stage breast cancer, because we know that these women will tend to live for a very long time and have very good outcomes overall. What I wanna point out in this study is look at the patient enrollment by years. So if you look, the um, era in which there was the highest increase in risk for cardiac death with longer follow-up in breast cancer um, patients who had adjuvant radiation therapy was actually in the pre-modern era. So it was actually in the period from 1973 to 1982 in the series. In the modern era, you can see that that increase in risk for cardiac death has largely gone away. And the reason we think that that's happened is that we've gotten a lot better at doing radiation. We can do it much more safely. We can do it much more precisely. And this has led to us being able to deliver really good radiation without increasing the risk for cardiac death. Now, I'll talk a little bit about a very splashy paper by Sarah Darby, but first I wanna start with something from the Early Breast Cancer Trialist Collaborative Group. This group is super important. They publish all of the big meta-analyses, which are basically analyses of lots of different studies, with lots of different patients, so we can see the true effect of any kind of intervention. But they actually first published on something called a dose effect for cardiac toxicity in 2005. And this was actually before the splashy um, Sarah Darby paper. What the dose effect basically means is this. The higher the dose of radiation that your heart receives, the higher your risk for cardiac toxicity. What that also suggests to us is that if we can lower the dose that your heart sees during your breast cancer radiation, we can also decrease the risk for cardiac toxicity. And I wanna point this out because this is really important. In the very leftmost column, you are looking at the heart dose range. So looking at the average dose to the heart. And what I want to point out is that this range is really huge. It goes from zero all the way to over 15 gray. 
This is a really important column, primarily because I want to let you guys know that we hardly ever give radiation in the 5 to 15 gray range. And we almost never, in fact, I've never seen it, give radiation over 15 gray. So what we're really talking about is this range right here, the 0 to 5 gray range, which is what we strive very hard to keep all of our breast plans um, the heart dose under. And you can see that in these patients, there was a non-significant um, cardiac risk. Now, just because it's non-significant doesn't mean that we don't want to protect your heart. In fact, we go to great lengths to minimize any heart exposure, primarily because we still need long-term follow-up. And the safest way to protect the heart is to ensure that the heart stays out of the radiation field. Next, I want to talk a little bit about the Darby paper because it was a really splashy paper and it actually led to the whole, um, the whole growth of a field called cardio-oncology. Basically, this was a population-based case control study of coronary events in about 2,000 women in Sweden and Denmark who received radiation for breast cancer between 1958 and 2001. And that's a big range. So you can see in this group, there are going to be some women who were treated in the modern era and also a lot of women who are treated in the pre-modern era. That era that I showed them in my first slide where we did see higher rates of cardiac toxicity. The next thing I want to point out is that the mean heart dose in this study was about 5 gray, which is on the upper range of what we accept in our radiation plants. But the range was huge, and it ranged from essentially 0 all the way up to 28 gray. That's a huge range. And of course, in the modern era, we would never accept a plan that delivered such a high dose to the heart. The last thing I want to point out about this study is that the mean heart dose to the whole heart was estimated in some of these patients. What does that mean? Well, in the modern era, what we do is something called a CT simulation for every radiation treatment plan. That means we bring you in, we get you into the position we're going to treat you in. So in breast cancer patients, this means your, heart, your arms are above your head, and you are in something called a breast board to keep you steady during your treatment. And then we do a CT scan in which we basically slice your body into three millimeter slices. And then Dr. Park, Dr. Prionis and I, we draw out on every single three millimeter slice what we want to treat and what we want to protect. In this way, we know accurately what the mean heart dose is. We don't have to estimate it. In the pre-modern era, we didn't do a CT simulation. Originally, we would just put people on the table and actually treat them. This was in the very, very early days of radiation. Subsequently, we started using 2D imaging, something called fluoroscopy. But all of these are a far cry from what we do today. So what the Darby paper found, which is really important, is basically, again, this dose effect of cardiac toxicity, meaning the higher, um, the, higher the dose of radiation your heart received as a byproduct of your breast radiation, the higher your rate of coronary events. And basically, this increased linearly with seven at about 7.4% increase in the rate per gray to the heart. This is a really complicated slide, so I want to break it down for us because I think it's really important. So panel A and panel B are related. Panel A is basically looking at the risk of death from cardiac disease. Panel B is looking at the risk of a coronary event. And it's a complicated graph, but there are a few things that are important. First, I want you to ignore this dotted line. This dotted line is looking at plans where patients have a mean heart dose of about 10 gray. That is super, super high, and we don't have plans in our patients in early stage or advanced stage with such a high heart dose. What I want you to look at next is actually the dashed line. That's an important line because that's looking at radiation therapy with a mean heart dose of 3 gray, which is still high for early stage breast cancer, but is something that we can see in patients who need their lymph nodes treated. And you can see in the dashed line for both cardiac death as well as cardiac events that if you have radiation with that mean heart dose, your risk of cardiac death as well as your risk of a cardiac event is going to be higher than if you have no radiation at all. The other thing that I want to point out in this graph is that they do something very nice here. They separate out based on cardiac risk factors, meaning if you have at least one cardiac risk factor, your baseline risk of cardiac death as well as a cardiac event is going to be higher than if you have no cardiac risk factors. 
The next thing I want to talk about in the Darby paper is actually my favorite part of the paper, which is actually the supplementary, supplementary materials that were provided in the tables in the appendix. And these are my favorite because they actually provide estimates of the risk of cardiac death in coronary, coronary events by a few things, age, the mean heart dose, and the presence of cardiac risk factors. I pulled this together. Um, you know, they actually go through much higher mean heart doses. So they go um, 0, 0 0.5, 1, 2, which you see here, and then they keep actually going up higher. But I actually cut those out just for the sake of simplicity and to show you what these tables look like and how we as radiation oncologists can use them to help estimate your risk of radiation-related um, cardiac toxicity. What I really want to point out that I think is very important is that in early stage breast cancer patients, our mean heart dose is actually almost always under one gray. And if you look at that, what that correlates to is actually a very, very small absolute risk of radiation related cardiac death by age 80 years old. And that's true no matter if you're getting radiation in your 40s, in your 50s, in your 60s, or in your 70s. And I just want to point this out because this just shows that if we protect your heart, we keep your heart out of the field, and we minimize the dose, we can ensure that the absolute risk of radiation-related cardiac toxicity by the time that you're 80 is very, very low. So let me talk a little bit about the evolution of radiation therapy. I talked a little bit about how there are significant advancements in technology, and this is true since the 1950s. The first thing that's really important is that patients are now immobilized. What that means is that we don't just put you on the table and allow you to move your arms however you want. We put all of our breast patients in something called a breast board. Most often patients are lying on their back with their arms up and their arms are being held in these little cup holders that help to keep them steady. This is really important because this makes sure that you aren't moving back and forth every day and that the radiation we've planned to the, to the millimeter is actually precise. The next thing that's different is that we do something called CT-based planning, which I talked a little bit about. This is what we commonly call a simulation. And again, what this is is a low dose CT scan of the area we're gonna treat. And on the CT scan, we draw out on every three millimeter slice of you what we wanna treat and also what we want to protect. This means that we don't need to just estimate the dose to your heart. Um, we can actually draw it out and get a much better and much more accurate um, understanding of what the dose is. The third thing is we've now started using something called respiratory gating. As you're breathing, your chest wall is going to be moving up and down, and that can create a lot of motion. The other thing that can happen is that we can actually use respiratory gating to help get your body into the perfect anatomy for radiation treatment in a way that really protects your heart. And the last thing is in patients requiring lymph node treatment, and again, this isn't everyone, these are more patients with locally advanced breast cancer, we can use intensely modulated radiation therapy, IMRT, um, as a valuable tool. All of these things together allow us to treat what we want to treat and protect what we want to protect. So I'm going to go into, um, I'm going to focus first on deep inspiration breath hold. And this is relatively um, a new addition to our breast program at UCSF. And it's something that we're really, really happy to be able to offer to our patients. My one caveat is I will tell you this, even if you were not treated with DIBH, we kept your dose, your heart dose as low as I showed you before on the previous tables. And we did that with really careful planning. But deep inspiration breath hold has been a great technology that we now use very, very frequently in our left-sided breast cancer patients. Basically, deep inspiration breath hold is a technique in which patients are asked to take a deep breath in and hold it during simulation and treatment. And there are two main benefits. The first benefit is that you have improved immobilization, meaning we don't even have your chest wall moving a little bit at all while you're breathing during your treatment. And the second thing is we are actually taking advantage of that deep inspiration breath hold to get a more advantageous positioning of the breast and chest wall relative to the heart and lungs. Specifically, we're moving the breast and chest wall away from the heart and lungs. 
And what this does is this basically allows us to take our left-sided breast plans and make them look like right-sided breast plans. So I wanna take a break right here and just have everyone try this so you can understand what deep inspiration breath hold is like for our breast cancer patients. So I'm gonna talk you through how I coach our breast cancer patients when I have them go home to practice for their simulation, okay? So the first thing I want you to do is if you can, I want you to lie on the ground or on the carpet or on the rug or wherever is comfortable, even if it's the bed, that's okay. The next thing I want you to do is I want you to take both of your hands and I want them to you to run them along your rib cage. So run your left hand along your left rib cage, run your right hand along your right rib cage and run them up towards the center of your chest where the rib cage meets. Okay, this is a really important place to remember. Now I want you to imagine that where your hands are meeting right now, there is a coin. And that coin is going to be really important because as you take a deep breath in, I want you to try to expand your lungs and raise that coin towards the ceiling. Okay, so now whenever you're ready, go ahead and put your arms above your head and then take a deep breath in and move that coin towards the ceiling. Now I can't see if everyone did that, but I hope that you did because that's exactly what we have our patients do when we have them do deep inspiration breath hold treatment. And when they do that, when they move that coin, that imaginary coin towards the ceiling, what they're really doing is they're pulling their breast and chest wall away from the heart to give us more favorable anatomy. If you take a look, this is a CT scan. Okay, so this is your right side, this is your left side, this is a patient with left-sided breast cancer, and this is really important because this is where the lumpectomy cavity is. How do I know? We can see here I've marked out the scar, and the other thing we can see is that the surgeon has left a clips in the lumpectomy cavity to help us identify it. Okay, you can see in the same slice of breast, whereas the radiation beam would come really close and even clip the heart, in a free breathing plan, that means without deep inspiration breath hold, using deep inspiration breath hold, actually the heart's been pulled down away from the field and more towards the center of the chest. So in that same corresponding slice, what you actually see is just great vessels. I'm gonna show you guys a couple of videos of going through plans um, for my actual patients. And hopefully that will even show you how the radiation beams are able to um, stay away from the heart with deep inspiration breath hold. Now there are several deep inspiration breath hold systems that you can use. Um, there's SDX and there's RPM. These are the most commonly used um, systems. Now we actually have both at UCSF, but for our breast patients, we generally use RPM. A coin, actually what we have is this box. And this box is really important because there are cameras in the room that monitor where the box is on the patient's chest. And what happens is when the patient breathes in, that box is going to rise up. And when it's in the perfect place, then the radiation beams will turn on. As the breath is let out, the box will come back down and the radiation beams will turn off. So this is what the process ends up looking like. So this is basically the patient breathing in, breathing out, breathing in, breathing out. The beam is only gonna turn on when the patient is in the threshold, meaning in between this line and this line. And actually we use even a much smaller window than they've given as an example. And instead of having the patient breathe in and out, what we do is we coach the patient in to a breath hold and we have them hold it. In early stage breast cancer, the breath hold ends up being about 30 seconds and most patients are able to do it. If patients aren't able to do it initially, if they practice, I've found that all of my patients are able to meet this breath, this breath hold. So I wanna show you this plan, um, which is a left-sided breast um, cancer patient. And I'm gonna actually play this video for you. So this is what I look at when I'm looking at a radiation plan, okay? 
So basically, I'll walk you through it. What's happening is this is the CT scan from the simulation. And as the video starts playing, we're gonna move down the body. So this is the left lung, the right lung. This is the breast, the area that we're treating. And this is the heart. And you can see the heart is coming in. The radiation beams are here and it's very far away from the heart. And even when we get to the very bottom of the heart, it never even comes near it. So the radiation beams stay very far away from the heart. And in this way, we're able to keep the mean heart dose at 38 centigrade. So we're not talking about gray anymore. We're talking about centigrade. And in gray equivalents, this would be 0.38 gray. I'm gonna show you another plan. So same thing, it's going to start to play. And we're going down. And these are the radiation beams. And this is the heart. And you can see the beams are very far away from the heart because with deep inspiration breath hold, we've managed to pull the heart down and towards the middle of the chest. Oh, I'm sorry, this is just the same one. I just played it again. So I have another plan, I'm gonna play this one. And this is the same thing where you can see that the beams are coming in, the heart is in the middle, the patient's in a deep inspiration breath hold. And as the beams go down, you can see it's very far away from the heart, okay? And you can see in this plan, the mean heart dose was 29 centigrade. So again, we're talking about very, very low doses, less than one gray, less than 0 0.5 gray. The last thing I'm gonna talk about in the evolution of radiation therapy and cardiac sparing is intensity modulated radiation therapy. And this is a really important technique and it's been a valuable tool. And it's something that I have worked very hard to help um, start at UCSF in, um, in, terms of a, in terms of using it programmatically because it really is a powerful tool for cardiac sparing. So in some patients, um, who have more advanced breast cancer, we need to treat the regional nodes. And the breast cancer regional nodes generally are under the arm, okay, um, extending towards under the clavicle, above the clavicle, or along the breastbone. These are what we call the internal mammary nodes. Mm -hmm. When we treat all of them, you can imagine it gets very, very close to the heart, especially for left-sided patients. However, we know that treating these areas helps to improve disease-free survival for breast cancer patients. So the question has been, how can we do this safely for our patients? IMRT is an advanced form of radiation therapy. It is able to deliver precise radiation doses to the target areas by modulating the intensity of the radiation beam in multiple small volumes. What does that mean? It basically can control the dose to very, very small areas. Typically with IMRT, we use combinations of multiple fields that come from multiple different beam directions. And all together, this allows us to produce a customized radiation plan. IMRT allows us to make sure that we can give higher radiation doses both on the tumor or the areas where we're trying to treat while minimizing the dose to the surrounding normal structures. One thing I really want to point out is that this is used in patients who require nodal irradiation. In our practice, we don't use it in early stage node negative breast cancer, primarily because this would actually increase the dose to the heart, and that's absolutely what we don't want to do, especially since we've been able to get it so low. This is an example of an IMRT plan. So you can see that instead of two beams, what we actually have are basically six to nine beams that come from multiple different directions. The challenge initially when we were doing this, these plans with six to nine beams was that the treatment would take about 25 to 30 minutes, several minutes per beam. The challenge with that was that it wasn't compatible with DIBH, with deep inspiration breath hold. And while this was able to keep our mean heart dose at around five to six gray for left-sided patients, which is really good, we knew we could do better. And we knew we could lower that dose even more if we could do this with deep inspiration breath hold. So the solution came when we transitioned from what we call static beams. So that's basically the radiation machine treats this beam 
and then moves and then treats this beam and then moves and then treats the next beam. So we move from what we call static beams to rapid arcs. Generally, for the same type of plan, we'll use about three to five arcs. And the amazing thing is that these arcs travel very quickly. So basically, the, ra the radiation machine is traveling like this very quickly around the patient. And each arc can be delivered in about 45 to 60 seconds. What that meant for us as a program was that this was compatible with deep inspiration breath hold. And so we started using deep inspiration breath hold in these patients. This is an example of a patient who required regional nodal irradiation because she had much more advanced breast cancer. And I wanna show you how we were able to keep the heart dose very, very low using this ARC plan, rapid ARC plan with deep inspiration breath hold. So again, we're moving down and you can see it's a much bigger area because this patient had more advanced disease. And so we were treating all of the nodal fields. And you can see here, the heart is coming in. She's in a deep inspiration breath hold. And you can see as we get lower and lower, it's still staying away from her heart. So the mean heart dose in this case was 2.96 gray. So still very, very low especially in a patient who's getting all of her regional nodes treated. So some take home points. First, cardiac toxicity from radiation therapy is related to dose. This is really important for us as radiation oncologists because it gives us a good goal of decreasing and minimizing the dose to the heart. Modern radiation therapy for early stage breast cancer ensures that the heart receives a minimal dose at levels that do not or barely increase the risk of cardiac toxicity. Deep inspiration breath hold, the technique I just showed you and that we practice together is an excellent way to minimize heart exposure during left-sided breast radiation. And finally, in patients with left-sided breast cancer who require regional nodal irradiation, IMRT can reduce the heart dose and this ARC plan, what we call VMAD, with with deep inspiration breath hold can further minimize heart exposure. And I wanna make a, a point here, which is that this is not comprehensive. There are many things we haven't talked about that we do in our practice, including prone breast treatment, partial breast irradiation, and even omission of radiation in carefully selected patients. And of course, um, these would all be things that you would discuss with your doctor um, if you needed to. So I'm gonna turn it over right now to Dr. Prionas, my colleague, and he's gonna talk about another really important aspect of our breast program, um, which is shorter treatment courses. Dr. Prionas. Good evening, everybody. And thank you, Dr. Yang. Um, my name is Nicholas Prionas. So as we, as we heard from Dr. Yang just now, she presented a variety of technologies and techniques to shape and orient the radiation beam to minimize side effects and, and protect and spare critical organs. Um, I'd like to now talk about some of the other variables we have in our control related to how much radiation and over how many treatments we prescribe the radiation treatments. So by the end of this section, hopefully you'll have a appreciation for the history of uh, whole breast radiation treatment, where we came from in terms of how long the radiation courses are, uh, where we are today and where we're going in the future. The, the punchline is going to be that we are moving more and more towards shorter radiation treatment courses, fewer total treatments. I've shown kind of a chronology here starting in the decades of the 50s through the 90s, were very rough uh, decades there, starting with the invention of the clinical linear accelerator, which was um, uh, now allowed us to treat deep-seated tumors with radiation. And at that time and during those decades, we would treat the breast in five weeks of radiation treatment. Those are daily radiation treatments, not on weekends or holidays. So with five business days, five weeks, we're talking about 25 treatments. You can then see that in subsequent decades, uh, we got shorter and shorter. In the 90s and 2000s, three weeks of radiation treatments were studied. And I've listed underneath the cl clinical trials that were studying these shorter regimens. And actually the decades I've listed here are really when these clinical trials were performed and when they accrued patients. And because we are really methodical and careful in changing our practice, 
it takes another decade or two before we actually implement these um, changes into our practice. So the three-week regimen you might see in the um, late 2000s and 2010s. By the um, 2000s and 2010s, there are clinical trials looking at one week of radiation treatment, just five treatments. And simultaneously, we'll also look at um, unique situations where one day, one single radiation treatment can be used in very carefully selected patients where the radiation is administered at the time of breast conserving surgery, the at the time of lumpectomy. Uh, and in that way, um, providing an opportunity to avoid having to come in for radiation treatments as an outpatient. We'll also touch upon uh, the omission of radiation treatment. Again, how we can very carefully select patients in which avoiding radiation treatment altogether might be an option. Now, um, this all starts off by just a rough understanding of how radiation works. Here is um, a standard theoretical curve of how radiation dose on the x-axis is related to the probability of killing cancer and controlling a tumor, so the probability on the y-axis, and the blue curve is tumor control. And on the uh, red curve is the probability of normal tissue damage, side effects. So if we just focus on the blue curve, if we pick a high enough radiation dose, we can guarantee with 100% certainty we can kill every cancer cell, kill a tumor, and make sure it doesn't come back. But at the same time, if we now focus on the red curve, the chances of causing normal tissue damage, injury, side effects, is also 100% at that point. So we have to identify a radiation dose shown by this vertical dashed line that maximizes the probability of controlling the cancer, making sure it doesn't come back, but also minimizing the chance of causing any side effects. And that ratio, that difference, is called the therapeutic ratio. In an ideal world, we could pull these two curves apart, the, the blue curve further to the left, the red curve for, further to the right, so that if ideally they don't, they don't even overlap. At that point, we could, we could pick a radiation dose to completely control cancer and not cause any side effects. In truth, if that was the case, radiation treatment would be very, very easy. Um, we're not there. However, um, the use of slightly more radiation per treatment may be associated with slightly pulling these curves apart. And that is what hypofractionation is. Fractions are the treatments and hypo, fewer. So by giving a little bit more radiation per treatment, we may be able to benefit from separating these curves a little bit. Now, this is a, a busy slide full of numbers, and I, I only show them to emphasize the fact that we have different variables we can control when prescribing radiation. In each row here are some of the clinical trials that we'll dive into in a moment that studied shorter and shorter treatment regimens, and each column is, is one of these different variables. So there's the total amount of radiation, the total dose in gray, the units that we uh, describe radiation. Uh, there is the fractions or number of treatments, so five weeks, 25 treatments. If you divide those first two numbers, you get the dose per treatment, dose per fraction. And on this first row, we're showing kind of standard conventional radiation treatment to the whole breast. Five weeks, 25 treatments. That two gray per treatment comes from studies of um, cancer cells and animal models showing that that is a safe amount to kill cancer cells while still allowing normal cells a chance to recover. And then if you hit them with the next treatment, you kill more cancer cells, but allow the normal to recover and on and on. Why 25 treatments? Because if we multiply two times 25, we get to 50, five zero, which is shown again in animal models and human studies to be an appropriate dose to kill and control microscopic disease, any rogue cancer cell left behind after surgery. That's not the case if we're talking about gross disease, like a, a bulky tumor, we need much higher radi radiation doses. But in the case of breast cancer, where we're most commonly going to surgery for a lumpectomy or a mastectomy, and we're really just talking about essentially an insurance policy treatment to make sure we're cleaning up after any rogue cancer cell left behind, 45 to 50 gray is an appropriate amount. Now the subsequent rows here show these clinical trials with fewer and fewer treatments. Um, we'll look at a Canadian trial that has 16 treatments, that's about three weeks. A study out of the United Kingdom with 15 treatments, again, three weeks. And then the more modern five treatment techniques, again, out of the same group from the United Kingdom. And you'll notice in the first column, the total dose is going down. You might say, well, that's, that's less radiation. The number of treatments is going down. But the 
dose per treatment is going up in the third column there. So it's kind of hard to compare this. It's slightly an apples to oranges comparison because we're changing so many of these variable, variables. So based on mathematical models of how radiation kills cancer cells, we've come up with uh, essentially calculators so, so that we can come up with an equivalent comparable number to make these head-to-head -head comparisons. That's this last column in this table. So uh, you'll see that in general, in that 45 to 50 range, an, an appropriate amount to kill microscopic disease. So let's dive into um, some of the clinical trials that looked at these three-week regimens, specifically out of Canada, the Ontario Clinical Oncology Group, out of the United Kingdom, and then some data out of MD Anderson in Texas uh, that is more applicable to the United States. And you know, the looking at clinical trials can be a little hairy. It's a lot of data. It can be kind of dry. More realistically, I'm showing it so that I can emphasize that we go through painstaking trials to make sure that treatments are safe, effective, and that we have really robust long-term data before we change our practice. Starting off with this Canadian or the so-called Whalen trial after Dr. Whalen, who uh, was the primary investigator, uh, this study compared a three-week regimen with 16 treatments to the conventional five-week regimen with 25 treatments. It's always really important to see who was actually studied in these, um, in these clinical trials. In this case, over 1,200 women were recruited. Here, T1 to 2, essentially meaning less than 5 centimeters in size, and N0, meaning no lymph nodes involved. These are women that had breast-conserving sur surgery, lumpectomies, in, this was back in the era, era of big lymph node surgeries, so they're having axillary lymph node dissections rather than sentinel lymph node biopsy procedures. And the separation, in other words, the, the distance from the midpoint of the chest over the breastbone or sternum all the way down to the middle of the armpit in the axilla was about 25 centimeters. And that metric will come up, we'll discuss that because it's a descriptor of sort of the size of patients. And the punchline here is that Comparing the three weeks and the five weeks, there was no difference in the chance of a local recurrence, of cancer coming back in the breast. There was no difference in disease-free survival. In other words, the chance of death or cancer coming back in any way. And there was no difference in the cosmetic outcome, the appearance of the breast. And those were all measured at 10 years after completing treatment. That's shown in these curves on the bottom. So the bottom left, on the x-axis, we have time since, since completing treatment and the y-axis is the percent of patients who have a local recurrence, in other, words, in other words, cancer coming back in the breast. And the two curves, three weeks versus five weeks, five weeks are superimposed, they're on top of each other, no difference. Similarly on the right graph here, x-axis is time, y is the chance of survival. Ideally, we wanna be at 100%, everyone surviving. That's generally not seen, but here, the three-week and five-week curves are right on top of each other, equal survival. Out of the UK, at a similar time, uh, there was another trial looking at a different three-week regimen. In this case, 15 treatments, just one less, but still done in three weeks. To over 2,000 women recruited, similarly small tumors. They did allow patients with limited number of lymph nodes involved. And we're showing here on this, this chart the chance of a recurrence in the breast or lymph node areas over time. The three-week regimen is in the green curve and the five-week is in the red curve. And statistically, these two curves are not differentiable. In absolute value, the three-week curve looks a little bit less, but we don't, we consider these to be equivalent. So again, equal cancer control between these two treatment courses. But what was interesting out of this um, UK study is that they showed some very interesting cosmetic outcomes. In this plot here, this is a way to, to show um, data comparing the two studies, the, the two uh, regimens rather, the three week and the five week. Each row here is a different observation. So we have breast shrinkage, breast induration, which is sort of thickening of the breast, breast edema or swelling, telangiectasias, which are little blood vessel changes after radiation. If you've spent a lot of time in the sun or if you ever look at the V-neck area on your chest, you might actually see some little tiny blood vessel changes just from sun exposure. Shoulder stiffness and then swelling of the arm, arm edema, also called lymphedema. Anything to the left of this vertical line at the number one says that it was better 
there was less of any of these outcomes in the three-week arm. And anything to the right of that vertical line says that the five-week arm was better. And we see that breast shrinkage was better for the three-week arm, breast thickening and breast swelling, and those small blood vessel changes, all better for the three-week arm. So now we, we have shown that three weeks of radiation to the whole breast has equal cancer control as a five-week course and has be better cosmetic outcome. A lot of people criticize these trials saying, well, these aren't American patients. You know, our patients are different. Um, so there was data that came out of MD Anderson in Texas that uh, said, okay, let's look at what our how our patients do with three weeks versus five weeks. Almost 300 patients looked at here. 76% of them considered to be overweight or obese by, by body mass index. 79% reported as a, a C cup in terms of their um, breast size or larger. And what was important, what was importantly shown here is that the cosmetic outcomes held true. So the shorter treatment courses with three weeks hypofractionation had less dermatitis, skin irritation, pruritus, itching of the skin, pain, tiredness, lack of energy, and then in this um, survey that patients were given, less trouble meeting family needs. And in other words, they were functioning at a higher level with a three-week course. That was all measured at six months. So now we have applicable data that, that we can describe for patients who have a larger separation, a larger body mass index, who are maybe more similar to some of the patients we treat here in the United States. So at this point, we are um, governing body, ASTRO, this is the sort of uh, society to which we are all members of as radiation oncologists, has a consensus statement that says, if you're treating the whole breast, hypofractionated radiation, a shorter course, three weeks, not five, is the standard of care. It, back in 2011, shown on this table here, they were starting to support that. So they said, well, conditionally, if you're older than 50, small tumor, no lymph nodes, you haven't had chemo, maybe you can do it. By 2018, we say everybody, essentially. Um, any age, any stage, as long as you're just treating the breast, you're not talking about treating lymph node areas. It doesn't matter if you've had chemo before or after your surgery, or, but before radiation. So now that is our standard. Of course, there are unique cases, and that depends on a discussion with your physician to know whether whole breast radiation in three weeks is applicable for you. Not to belabor the point, but here's the verbiage from the um, consensus statement. So for women with invasive breast cancer receiving WBI whole breast irradiation with or without inclusion of the low armpit area, um, it's preferred to use a hypofractionated scheme. And they've actually written out here either the UK scheme with 15 treatments or the Canadian scheme with 16 treatments. Now, fast forward another uh, decade or two, and um, that same group out of the UK is asking, can we go down to one week of radiation treatment, just five treatments? And we'll start off with what they call the UK FAST trial. And I really shouldn't call this one week. It's really five treatments. And um, you can see, again, they selected women who are older than 50, small tumors, less than three centimeters in size, with no lymph nodes involved, almost 1,000 women recruited. And they were comparing two different dose levels with five treatments, but they were one treatment per week. You can see we make very cautious, conservative steps. We say, let's, let's be very careful here. We'll, we'll space the treatments out by a week so that we make sure that if any side effect is happening, we can catch it. We're describing patients who did not have breast shrinkage or breast induration, that thickening. So again, this is over time since completing treatment, you would wanna be at the top near 100. 100% absence of these adverse outcomes of shrinkage or induration. And on the shrinkage side, the light sort of teal curve is the higher dose treatment over five treatments. And then the other, the red and blue, are the slightly lower dose five treatments and then the conventional five weeks. Those two top curves are indistinguishable. On the right side for breast induration, the five-week course is actually a little bit higher, and actually it's statistically a little bit higher, suggesting that these five treatment courses may have a little bit more in duration. However, the likelihood is still very, very small. We generally report these cosmetic and, and toxicity side effect results first because we can measure those early on, and then we wait years to see 
is the chance of cancer coming back any different between these different regimens? We wait five years, 10 years, um, rarely longer because it costs money to run these trials longer, but we, here we've shown um, survival analysis and the chance of a recurrence in the breast. I put a red box around the 10-year data, and, and the punchline here is that, that there's no difference. So cancer control is equal with these five treatments compared to the 25 treatments. Now the same group said, okay, let's, let's make this a little bit more um, uh, faster, no pun intended, UK fast forward. So they took the five treatments and they did them all in one week. Similar patient population, still older than 50, small tumors, no lymph nodes involved, similar number of patients, um, you know, just under 400. And now because this is done later in time, they're comparing five fraction, five treatment courses against the three week course, because that had become a standard in the meantime. And again, they picked two doses, 27 versus 26 gray, to see if there's any difference. And we've plotted here that on the x-axis time since um, treatment, and on the y-axis, the percent of patients who have cancer come back in the breast. And it's really zoomed in, you know, the, the top uh, value on that y-axis here is 3%, very, very small. And these curves are not different statistically. This was designed to be a non-inferiority trial. So in other words, the five treatments in just one week was not inferior to the three week treatments in terms of controlling the cancer. And that data is out to, you know, five years. Shown here is the toxicity or side effect profile of this one week treatment. So on the left, we have side effects during treatment. On the x-axis, we're looking at weeks since starting radiation treatment. On the y-axis is the percentage of patients who experience those side effects. And we describe side effects um, in, in terms of grades. So, you know, grade one is generally something mild. Grade two is slightly more severe. Grade three is significantly severe. Grade four might require hospitalization. Grade five is death. So here we don't even discuss that because generally we're talking about probably skin irritation, redness in, uh, in terms of common radiation side effects. If we look at the top three curves, the solid ones, the kind of intermediate gray, the top gray is, uh, top curve is the, um, longer course, three weeks. You, you know that because it's longer on the x-axis. And the uh, five treatment curves are just under that. And it's just important to see that typical radiation treatment, there are a few side effects early on, they build up over time, they reach a peak, and then they taper down and go away. But they are lower and tapering faster on the five treatment curves. If we look at slightly higher grade side effects, that still holds true. That's those dashed lines below that. Less common to have higher grade toxicity, but still better in the um, five treatment arm. And the grade three toxicities, you, you can't even see. There was only one, um, and of course, no grade four or five. That's all just in the weeks around treatment. But if we look five years out, the shorter treatment courses with five treatments did statistically have higher breast induration, thickening, and swelling. But the total, the absolute numerical chance of that is tiny, 1.6%, 2.4%. So it's very, very unlikely and still considered extremely safe. Now, all of that data was mostly in reference to treating the whole breast. In women who have more advanced disease with lymph nodes involved, the, the discussion is around treating the breast and lymph node areas. Um, that was also all data mostly after breast conserving surgery, but what about after a mastectomy? Um, admittedly, this is an area, area that we're now starting to enter to ask the question, can we deviate from the five-week courses and go shorter? Some um, somewhat recent and, and robust data that we have is out of a clinical trial from China where women who had had mastectomies with no reconstruction, just a flat chest after their surgery, were randomized to have either the conventional five weeks of radiation treatment or a three week course. You can see the total amount is slightly different from the other trials, but it's still 15 treatments. In terms of who these patients are, as you'd expect, they have far more advanced disease, bigger tumors, far more lymph node involvement. And they followed patients. We have five years of data. Actually, we have slightly longer now. And importantly, the local recurrence, the chance of cancer coming back in the chest wall or lymph node areas was similar and low, around 8%. And 
And in terms of side effects, they were no different, no difference in overall side effects. And actually the three week course had less of this grade three skin toxicity, uh, eight versus 3%, still a small number, but lower than the conventional treatment course. So that's, that's promising news and consistent with what we'd seen when we were treating the breast only. A question, an important question remains, what about women who have reconstruction after a mastectomy? And I don't have that answer for you. It's an ongoing clinical trial that's accruing. Uh, we are members of this trial and here at UCSF and we are, it's called Fabric Trial. So um, in the case that you are eligible, these are women who have had mastectomy for locally advanced uh, breast cancer and have had a reconstruction with an expander that will be replaced to an implant down the line. And we're comparing the five-week course to a three-week course. Um, the hypothesis, of course, being, is it the same as that Chinese trial? Are we going to have equal cancer control and maybe at least similar, hopefully better side effect profile? But an important question of how does it affect the implant? How does it affect the risk of losing an implant from infection or other complications? So that is coming down the pipeline. Now, similarly, and I really probably shouldn't have shown this as chronological, it was happening at the same time as hypofractionated external beam radiation to the whole breast. There were studies looking at single day treatments, intraoperative radiation administered at the time of breast conserving surgery so that the area where the cancer started can be irradiated and the patient can potentially avoid having to come in for outpatient radiation treatments. Two important trials in this area are the TARGET trial and the Elliott trial. And the, one of the key differences is in the technology that they use. The TARGET trial is looking at the use of low energy photons. So that's a picture in the upper right here. So these women come in for their, their surgery um, after undergoing anesthesia, you know, completely out. Uh, the breast surgeon is performing the lumpectomy, a potentially and likely a sentinel lymph node biopsy. Um, and assuming there are no concerning features in that moment, um, which I'm happy to extrapolate on, things like being close to the skin, the ratio of the size of the tumor removed being too large compared to the size of the breast. If everything's favorable, then intraoperative radiation can be used using this spherical applicator that you see here, placed into the cavity at the time that it is sort of exposed to the world. Cav that cavity is closed around that applicator so that the, the surface that is the so-called margin um, that is left behind after the tumor is removed can then be sort of sterilized with radiation. It's so that any little microscopic cancer cell that's nearby can be picked off, killed, and the risk of a recurrence of breast cancer lowered. That's the hypothesis. The Elliott trial uses a different technology. These are high energy electrons, but similarly, after perform, uh, performing the lumpectomy and the nodal sampling, an electron machine is moved into place. That's shown on the bottom right here. I apologize for the slightly gruesome photo. Um, and this treatment is again, delivered to the area of the surgery, to that margin to take care of any rogue cancer cell left behind. If we dig into the actual data of these trials and the target trial, these are slightly younger women, 45 or older, but again, small tumors. And now we're gonna start talking about biology a little bit. Low grade, no lymph nodes invo involved, estrogen dependent. And the trial compared that single treatment with intraoperative radiation to the three, three week course of external radiation to the whole breast. And in terms of five year chance of cancer coming back, there was a 3.3% versus 1.3% chance of recurrence. Statistically different numbers, but absolutely both tiny. So probably appropriate, definitely appropriate for the right candidates. Interestingly from this trial, we also saw that there was a lower chance of death in some women, particularly women who had the intraoperative radiation. And there's a hypothesis that it was because there was less cardiac risk specifically in women with left-sided breast cancers. So this may be another way to minimize radiation to the heart in very select patients. The Elliott trial, again, different technique, um, but single fraction treatment compared to five weeks of radiation, similar outcome. The intraoperative technique does have a higher chance of recurrence in five years, absolutely, but it's still a very, very small chance in five years. And this intraoperative technique had less skin side effects as you would affect because you're not treating the whole breast. 
So this is an option, a possibility for very carefully selected patients. And that's an important discussion to have uh, with your surgeon and, and radiation oncologist, importantly, um, to see if it is appropriate. During this chronology that I've been showing, there was simultaneously more learning and studying of the biology of breast cancer. And I haven't talked about that at all to this point, but we've come to appreciate that there are different types of, of breast cancer in terms of how they behave, how aggressive they are. There's the so-called luminal A, commonly seen in older postmenopausal women. These are estrogen dependent cancers. They have low proliferation rate, the so-called KI67 marker. And that's different from luminal B, slightly more uh, proliferative, or the more aggressive types that are HER2 positive or the so-called triple negative, which are not dependent on estrogen or female hormones, nor are they dependent on the HER2 pathway. And in these three plots, we're looking at, over time, what is the chance of a re recurrence in the breast for patients who have uh, endocrine therapy only, anti-estrogen medicines, that's the yellow curve, versus endocrine therapy, therapy plus radiation, the blue curve. If we start on the far right, those two curves are really far apart. I wouldn't wanna be on the yellow curve, I would wanna be on the blue, where the chance of cancer coming back is very low, and that's combined therapy. But on the far left, in these luminal A, these estrogen-dependent, indolent, slow-growing cancers, those curves are pretty similar. So endocrine therapy alone, it looks similar to endocrine therapy plus radiation. So trials have tried to select and identify specifically those types of patients who have favorable, low-risk breast cancers, and can we potentially omit radiation completely? One such trial is this CalGB9343 trial that looked at women over the age of 70 with small lymph node negative tumors that are estrogen dependent, and they've had surgery with negative margins, breast conserving surgery. And these women are randomized, half had tamoxifen, an anti-estrogen medicine, and half had the tamoxifen plus radiation treatment. And on that plot on the left, we see over time the chance of, of, of being free of a local or regional recurrence, the, being free of cancer coming back. Those curves are similar, but I would point out the top curve, the solid, which is combined endocrine therapy plus radiation, is more close to 100% than the endocrine therapy alone. Numerically in that table, we can see at 10 years, the chance of cancer coming back in the breast with the endocrine therapy alone, the tamoxifen was 10%. That's 10% 10 in 10 years, 1% per year, which is sort of a benchmark in our minds of a appropriate background risk. But the addition of radiation lowered the risk to 2%. So, you know, a punchline is that radiation always lowers the chance of cancer coming back. But is that numerical difference meaningful? And in some women, they may accept 10% risk in 10 years. That comes down to a very personalized discussion of what are other competing health risks, um, sort of life expectancy, uh, risks of radiation treatment versus the risks of tamoxifen. And we'll dive into that topic a little bit more in a moment. Importantly, survival was equal in these two groups. Another similar trial, the PRIME2 trial, lower the age to 65, still small tumors, no negative, indolent biology, so endocrine uh, sensitive, so estrogen receptor positive, completely removed breast cancers after lumpectomy. Again, endocrine versus endocrine plus radiation therapy. And we see a similar story here. In five years, the chance of cancer coming back in the breast is about 4% with the endocrine therapy alone, reduces down 1.3% with radiation. A small numerical difference, but, but there is a difference. Similar overall survival. And that's shown graphically here. Um, appropriately, they've scaled the y-axis to 100%. So you see how tiny these differences are on the two curves. So uh, women who are older than 65 have indolent breast cancers that are dependent on estrogen, who are planning to actually take hormone therapy, that had small breast cancers, no lymph nodes involved, that were completely removed by surgery. In that case, maybe radiation can be avoided if they're willing to accept the risk of recurrence with endocrine therapy alone. It's also important to emphasize that endocrine therapy has its own side effect. It's an important discussion to have with a medical oncologist. And for some women, they may not be able to tolerate those side effects because um, of underlying conditions like osteoarthritis um, or, or other conditions, or just because they are, are sensitive to those medications. 
So hopefully you, you see that there are, there's an evolving shift here towards shorter and shorter treatments. In the future, you may hear about patients getting one week of treatment more frequently. Three weeks is still the standard to the whole breast, but I'll emphasize as Dr. Yang did, it comes down to an important conversation with your radiation oncologist on what is appropriate for your case specifically. And now we'll pass things on to uh, Florence Yuan, the nurse practitioner on our team, who will be talking about um, side effects and management of side effects from radiation to the breast. I'm gonna talk a little bit about skin care and radiation skin reactions, which is an important component of our, our breast cancer care. So acute radiation dermatitis, that's the skin reaction that we see mainly when people are getting radiation. 90% of our patients will develop <clears throat> some type of acute radiation dermatitis during the time that they're getting treated. And this will affect the top layer of the skin, the epidermis, all the way down to the dermis here at the bottom. And what happens is there's a layer here called the stratum basum, which is responsible for replicating and rep reproducing our skin cells every 21 days. Radiation can damage this. Um, fortunately, it does repair itself. So that alters the way the skin replicates and reproduces itself. And this can start with the first dose of radiation. And you see in the dermal layers here at the bottom, there are the oil glands, the nerves, and the sweat glands. So these are things that get affected as well, and the hair follicles. So there can be some changes in hair growth patterns depending on the dose that we give you of, of radiation. So in terms of grading radiation reactions, these are a couple of common grading scales that we use. Therapeutic radiation reactions usually occur in a very uh, progressive, gradual type of sequence. So we know what to expect and when it's going to happen. And we'll talk a little bit more about that timeline. Some of the factors that contribute to radiation dose are the cumulative dose, anything above 30 gray. Uh, the fraction of dose that we're giving and the length of treatment. So higher dose and longer treatment equals more skin reaction. The proximity of any sensitive tissues or organs in terms of breast care, um, when we're including the supraclavicular nodes, that area has a tendency to be thinner. So we may see more of a reaction there. Um, also, if you've had prior sun exposure, if you were, like to tan when you were younger, there could be some sun damage there that can cause some increased reaction while you're getting your radiation. The type of surgery that you have also plays into the type of reaction that you're gonna have. Um, for example, if you've got um, intact breast and we're radiating your whole breast, you generally will do very well. Um, if you've had a mastectomy or a mastectomy with reconstruction, these are patients that we have a tendency to see um, increased skin reactions in. The use of bolus. Bolus is something that we use to help increase the dose to an area that we're trying to target, such as the skin on your chest wall in the cases of a mastectomy or in patients with active disease, such as tumor that we're trying to treat. If patients are getting concurrent therapy, sometimes we'll use something called Zolota um, for some of our higher staged patients um, with active disease to really try to target that skin and increase the intensity. Individual patient characteristics, uh, such as increased weight, larger breast size, um, skin tone can all, um, breast size play a factor into it. Skin tones, not so much. Uh, some of our fair skin patients um, are afraid that they're gonna get really bad burns, but that's not the case. Um, uh, and some of our darker skin patients actually have more of a reaction and they have a tendency to have uh, hyperpigmentation or tanning for a longer period of time. And certainly with older age, the skin um, replication turnaround time is a little bit slower. So you will tolerate it well uh, for patients who are older. We treat a lot of women in their 80s and they do fine, uh, but it just may take a little bit longer for you to get through that reaction. And then finally, if we're using a boost, which is an extra dose to the lumpectomy cavity, but with our improved targeting, um, we don't see much of a skin reaction that is caused by that. That's gonna be really bad. 
So in terms of a radiation dermatitis timeline, as I said, radiation is very predictable. And then the first couple of weeks, really there's a minimal skin reaction. So we don't see much of anything happening at all. Uh, some women are much more sensitive. So they may report that they feel a little bit of tingling in their skin. Uh, they may see some transient redness that just comes and goes, but it's all very temporary. Uh, towards the end of that second week, some of the women will start to notice that they're having a little bit of hyperpigmentation or a little bit of redness might be starting to develop there, but not so much. Usually that starts to happen around the beginning of the third week. And as Dr. Prionis was talking about in terms of our hypofractionation, if women are getting that hypofractionated course, they're usually finishing their whole breast in the third week and then getting a either boost of the lumpectomy cavity in fourth week or nothing at all. So during that third week, uh, many women will start to experience some dryness and itching in the skin. And it goes back to that decreased functioning of the sweat and sebaceous glands in the, the dermis that we're affecting. But remember, all that is temporary. Uh, the erythema, the redness that we see may still be mild, but that may be starting to increase. And some women will report starting to feel a little bit of discomfort, um, and the skin might feel a little bit sensitive to them. And here we have in weeks four to six, you have more moderate to severe erythema, dry desquamation, which would be a flaking and peeling of the skin, um, as I said, more a swelling, a more edema, there could be something called moist desquamation, which is loss of the upper layer of the skin uh, that can lead to some exposed dermis, some drainage, some tenderness, and an increased risk for infection. And certainly when the skin is open, um, there's risk for more discomfort. But during that time, we are finishing up. These are some of the acute reactions that you see in patients. Um, they're not all breast patients, but here's one uh, patient who's getting both breast mild erythema, and she was in about her third week of radiation there. In the middle, we have moderate erythema, an example of that. This is usually what we see at the end, uh, sometimes of the third to fourth week um, in a more severe reaction. Here's a gentleman who had some infected moist desquamation with some drainage um, and some infection. And you can see the skin is open and broken down there. On the bottom left, we have a patient who's resolving moist desquamation. That white patchiness is all new skin coming in. And that pink redness is uh, healthy tissue. And that usually heals in without much scarring um, at all. You probably won't notice any scarring with that healing in. We have an example of that dry desquamation, the itchiness, and that dry skin there. Um, that patient has completed radiation. And then I also included an example of hyperpigmentation, which is a woman of color, a little bit darker, olive toned skin. As I said, they have a tendency um, to have a little bit more hyperpigmentation towards the end and for a prolonged period of time. But again, that is expected to be temporary, but it will take time to fade. So in terms of about five years ago at UCSF, we were doing a lot of, um, we were switching over to the hypofractionation, but a lot was still standard care where we were doing five weeks or 50 gray of treatment. And our standard of skincare at that time was just kind of cleansing and moisturizing. And you could see we have a smattering of skin reactions here from dry desquamation to a mix of moist desquamation, peeling a woman here with bilateral redness. This is that same woman who was at the end of her five weeks. And you can see some redness up at the top for her superclav and her breasts. Uh, on the bottom is a woman who finished her treatment and we were using some honey pads to help treat her. And here at the bottom is just a woman who finished and had some peeling and a little bit of moist desquamation, but she actually healed up um, really well. So in terms of general skincare guidelines, if you look out anywhere, you'll find just some general guidelines, washing your skin with mild soap and water, uh, skin such as Dove and Neutrogena and Cetaphil are very mild on the skin. So those are the things we would recommend you use. Here at UCSF, we use something called 
integrity spray, uh, which is an actual wound cleanse uh, spray. We like it because it cuts, um, it's very mild, it's pH balanced, it doesn't irritate your skin. And what it does is it kind of gently exfoliates the skin and takes off the old dead skin cells. We don't want you rubbing on the skin, so people will tell you to just pat it dry. No washcloths, um, no loofahs or exfoliants. You want to avoid irritants such as alcohols and gels. Lanolin can be very irritating and tea tree oils. Certainly no tape on the skin because that can cause a little skin tear. Uh, we want patients to protect their skin from sun and friction. So if you're doing the super clav or you've got this V, wearing a shirt that's a little bit higher in the neck to protect it from active sunlight is um, preferred. Uh, you can use de deodorants and antiperspirants and moisturizers are recommended. When I said we had looked back and we wanted to do better um, when we were doing our five weeks, we actually came together as a group and started looking at skincare recommendations. And we found out there's no standard of care for skincare in the country in terms of people undergoing radiation. So you might come to our institution and get um, a lot of skincare products. You may go to a different institution and they may give you a cream or they may recommend something or you may get nothing at all. So it really uh, changes from institution to institution. But what um, this is a group that came together of multidisciplinary people and it was back in 2013. And what they did was review the um, current skincare evidence that was out there. And they found that there wasn't a lot of information out there, but they did come up with two helpful recommendations. Um, and this is what we've tried to carry over into our skincare. And one is the use of a high potency topical steroid cream called, um, it's actually a moderate um, potency steroid cream, um, something called Mometazone. And the second is Mepitel film. Uh, they also recommended not to use aloe. A lot of patients like to use that, but they found that that's very drying on the skin and avoiding oils, which can potentiate your radiation reaction. They also found that there wasn't really a lot of difference in using some moisturizing cream, so they could not make a strong recommendation for that. So we came up with our standard skincare for UCSF, and I think we're unique um, in that we provide all our patients with the skincare products that they need, so they don't need to go out and buy anything. And we just kind of want to make sure that we're taking care of the skin, because if you have breaks in treatment, uh, then your treatment is not as effective. So things we recommend are cleansing, either mild soap and water or the use of our skin integrity spray, and we would use that uh, throughout the treatment moisture management, making sure your skin stays hydrated, not too much, not too little, just enough. So we'll use calendula cream for that. And you can see that that's part of this here. Uh, we will manage desquamation. So either dry desquamation or moist desquamation. I have to say, we don't see a lot of dry desquamation. And I think it's because we're good at moisturizing the skin and using the skin integrity to take off all that old skin, dead skin that comes off. And reduction of friction. And we do that in a couple of ways. We use something called Mepilex Light and we use something called Mepitel Film. And I'll show you that a little bit more in the next slide. So Mepitel Film is one of the recommendations that came out of that skincare group. Uh, we're one of the, I think we're probably one of the only institutions in Northern California that use it routinely because it's not very accessible to institutions and we have a special purchasing agreement with the company uh, to purchase it. But it really helps cut down on the radiation dermatitis. We place it at the beginning of treatment and we now place it over the whole breast. In the past, we used to just place it in areas of high friction that we're going to uh, be prone to breakdown, such as the inframammary fold and the axilla. Now we'll place it on the whole breast. We usually like to leave it in for seven days. If it doesn't stay on, then we will replace it. But if it keeps coming off, we have other things that we can use. Once patients start getting red, we leave it off and we look at using other skincare products, such as a, a product here that you see. And this is a patient at the beginning of treatment, patient at five weeks, and you can see her skin is intact and it's just basically a little bit of pinkness and redness. So it actually does a really nice job of protecting the skin. And I'll go to our next slide. 
If patients aren't able to keep um, the Mepitel film, we switch to something called Mometazone, and again, based on those recommendations. And Mometazone is that high dose moderate steroid cream. We use it once a day, and here's a patient with uh, mastectomy, and she got four weeks of radiation. And you can see her at the beginning, at, at the end, her skin also was intact, but she did have some redness under the arm, but that was very manageable. And we just did that with the steroid cream, some calendula, and also the skin integrity. So she tolerated her therapy very well as well. Okay. We also have in our, our goodie bag, uh, we like to use Manuka honey. It's uh, not like other honeys. It works by releasing MG, which is different from the other honeys. So the byproduct is like a hydrogen peroxide mix. It was originated in New Zealand and Australia, very popular in the wound care population. Um, it actually will hinder microbe growth and it's really effective against gram-negative, gram-positive, um, anaerobic bacteria, and MRSA. It will actually bring moisture into the skin. It will debreed old tissue and reduce biofilm, which is an invisible bacterial film that sometimes you'll see on wounds. So we like to use this a lot, and it's been very effective in managing erythema and also in managing some of the wounds that can occur from radiation. And I'll go to the next slide. Uh, as I talked about, we use silicone dressings also, um, Mepilex Light. It's very good on the skin. It's safe tech technology, so it's silicone based. It was developed uh, for use with burn patients, so it does not traumatize the skin when it comes off. Uh, so we use this to reduce friction. If patients have Mepilex light on, we take it off when they're getting their treatments. If we're using the film, then we just basically leave that in place. If patients go on to develop moist desquamation or a wound, we basically have used the wound care literature to manage that. So I always say we've gotten rid of the old fashioned kind of old school dressings and replaced that with some of the newer things. So we don't use a lot of antibiotic ointments such as your triple antibiotics or the silvadine cream, um, mainly because the silvadine cream can be irritating to the skin. And there's so many newer things out there that we'll use that have silver in it. So we'll use the dressings or we'll use some gels that have silver in it. We'll also replace that gauze and tape with those silicone dressings. And in place of the triple antibiotic ointment, we'll use Manuka honey because there's no bacterial resistance with that at this time. And it's not irritating to the skin. And it's very effective against numerous types of bacteria. Okay, and I'll go to the next slide. So I kind of want to finish up here in terms of reconstruction and just say a little bit of a, a word about that. We actually do take care of a lot of reconstructed patients um, because we have a team approach with our plastic surgeons and they are really at the highest risk. Patients with mastectomies and um, mastectomies with reconstructed breast um, have the severest reactions and both short term and they can be more prolonged um, having some tightness after the radiation is done. So we are really vigilant about our skincare and follow up with them. We'll start off with our skincare regimen and we will follow them weekly until they're healed up. So many times even after they're done with their radiation, we're seeing them back just to check and make sure that they're not having any issues. Um, they can always develop an infection. We quote our patients that there's always a potential for implant loss, meaning you can get an infection or develop a complication where the implant or expander needs to be taken out and it's unable to be replaced again. So that's always the worry in somebody who's reconstructed and getting radiation. We have about a 15% risk for patients to lose their implants. I've had patients come in from outside institutions and they've been told um, their low numbers have been 25 to 40 percent. So it is a real risk that is out there. The two critical times are at the time they're completing their radiation and they have their most severe skin reaction and at the time of the implant exchange or placement of the permanent implant, which is usually about six months after the radiation is completed. And that's because there's those skin changes, um, there's some changes in the vasculature of the skin, so there can be some problems with wound healing. 
So I'm going to show you a couple of pictures, um, and that's kind of what I'm going to end with for you guys. So I'll show you some of the complications. So the first photo shows you a picture of some early cellulitis. This patient made it through radiation, and you see your skin looks great. But this redness here is concerning. And I believe she just had an infection, um, a tooth infection or a throat infection that just kind of spread. So she was started on some antibiotics and that cleared up and she went on to have a successful implant exchange. In the middle, we show you a bad thing that can happen. It doesn't happen very often, uh, but this is a patient who was treated on an outside institution institution and came to our plastic surgeons. And what you're seeing here is just infection uh, that eroded the skin and caused the implant to be extruded. And you're seeing some um, tissue and implant right there. And finally, uh, this is a patient who was having her six month implant exchange and she did well, but she unfortunately had delayed wound healing um, and that incision didn't heal up and it ended up getting infected. She was on multiple courses of antibiotics. Uh, they tried to replace it, but unfortunately, they ended up having to take the implant out and not be able to replace it. And what happens when the implant comes out is because of the radiation, there's some scarring of the skin and that causes some scarring of the skin um, there. It doesn't mean you can't be reconstructed because there are other options, but it's very difficult for women to lose their implant and wear always vigilant about making sure and doing everything we can to prevent that from happening. So I thank you for letting me speak to you tonight. Um, and I hope we covered our, inject, our objectives and thank you. I just wanted to um, thank our um, organizers, Dawn and Dr. Um, Beretta. And I also wanted to thank my co-speakers um, Dr. Prionis and Florence Ewan, and uh, it's been really our pleasure to be here with you. And of course, if you have any other questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to us.